That's <laughs> Oh, Mark. Sheila, it's a different name there. Yeah, that's her. <laughs> Hi, Sheila. <laughs> Mike says, whoops, that was a different name. <laughs> that, yeah. Oh, that one. Share a, I share a Zoom account with Jesse Urban. Yes. <laughs> so we, uh, I'm always re-identifying myself whenever I sign on. Yeah, I always have to change it to Diana and Mike. It always comes up as Mike. I don't know why. <laughs> Can't imagine. <laughs> yeah, I, don't know how, I don't know how you change that forever. It's, it must have been Mike that signed up, and that's it forever and ever. Yeah, and the ever. account's yep. under his name, so no matter what, well, the computer is his name. <laughs> when we were delivering the signs, I stopped at uh, Rabbi's house, and this woman came out, and I said, "Oh, you're you're uh, Jesse Urban." Really? <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Urban is is 32 years old, and Every so often, you know, her picture will show up. It won't be just her name, but her picture. And I'm so tempted to just leave it up there. <laughs> be nice to look like a, a 32 year old again. Be fun. Uh, I'll, I'll Hi, Alice. For, Good morning, Alice. I'm going to settle for 39. <laughs> <laughs> I'd even take 49. Or 59. Or 69. No, no, no. I'm staying at 49. Or 79. <laughs> nope. No, no. Definitely not that one. <laughs> Not there. <laughs> well, you're not there yet, right? No, I'm not there. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Oh, David and everybody. I are still in bed. Everybody's hopping in. Okay. I don't see Jeff yet. No, he may not. He may not be able to. Yeah. I don't think I've let him in yet. So no. He was going to try. Depends. You know, it's an hour later there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. They're probably out somewhere because their weather is beautiful. Uh, so I'll tell everybody as you're coming in that um, you're going to go to breakout rooms today. So oh. and you have to do a survey while you're there. Um, but you just have to click on things. And I know everyone here can do it. And you're going to like it. And then once we practice today, we can do breakout rooms again. <laughs> can we play games in the in the breakout room? Well, it's a survey. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we could. It's fun, Diane. It's fun. We could do Jackbox games. I know. Well, maybe Harry will talk a little bit about right. that. Right. Sure, I will. Do you want? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We do it with our kids. We love it. <laughs> yes. Um, Harry, I do like to start as close to time as possible, but I'm still letting people in. So, um, I'm, it's, it's Jewish it's, time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I was taught when I was a kid is that Jewish time is a little bit later than the start time, except for funerals. Oh, yeah. Got to be on time for funerals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I ran, you know, a school and services and I started on time. Um, and... Um, and I, I also, one of my clergy is on, I also wrangled the clergy sometime and said, okay, we have a half hour at 1030, you know, wherever you're at, if you're not at Elenu, oh, well, we're moving on. So, um, yeah. We'll give, and, and, and it's daylight savings. I hope everyone had a good sleep last night. And that's, you know, a conversation for another day of, you know, do we need daylight savings? So. 32 and counting. That's pretty slow. Barbara Derek. Okay. So. One more minute, one more minute. I'm gonna say hi to Blair. Thanks for, hi. thanks for introducing me to all of this. You're welcome. And I'm looking forward to seeing your new website. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, this always, all right, I am, okay, let's see. So I am going to um, give you a speaker view. Um, I'm going to mute everybody. Um, you know, Harry, please unmute. And, um, Three, two, one. I am going to. Uh, oops. Um, oh, it's already okay. Okay, it's already going. So, welcome everyone. And um, 
Good to, good to see everyone. This morning, we welcome Harry Nathan Gottlieb. He is the founder of Unify America, and Unify America is setting out to conduct a massive experiment in de democratic decision making. Um, if you look him up online, and I'll give you the website a little bit later on, you'll find that I um, he founded and chaired two software companies in Chicago. One does interactive communications for businesses like Jellyvision, and the other does interactive party games called Jackbox Games. We I I love Jackbox Games, um, and and we and you should definitely go look into it. It's great to you know play on Zoom with your kids, and we can talk about that. Um, as I, as he, and he can tell you more about Unify America, and um, I, I won't go into that, but uh, a couple of things. One, we're going into breakouts. You, all you have to do is say yes, join, and then I'll bring you back, and you will take a survey there, um, but Harry's going to explain it step by step. So um, with no further ado, Harry, please. Thank you. Um, hello, Jews. Nice to be here on a beautiful Sunday morning. Um, I, um, so yeah, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing, um, but I wanted to begin with a story. Um, I have a 13-year-old a son whose name is Moses. And um, one day after Shabbat dinner, after one night after Shabbat dinner, he was telling us a story about a friend of his, another 13 year old who is his kind of political opposite. And uh, he regularly debates him. His name is Charlie, this other boy. And uh, he was thinking about his debates with Charlie and describing them. And then he stopped and said, you know, the thing is whenever I'm debating Charlie, I wanna win. And you know, I looked at him and he said, I think there's something wrong with that. I don't think it's that I should wanna win. I think it's that I should wanna learn. And I said to him, um, Moses, that insight dawns on so few adults at any point in their lifetime. <laughs> I'm really impressed. <laughs> so, you know, given given that reality, that it does dawn on so few adults in their lifetime, you can imagine that if one is living in a time where there are critical questions facing a nation of people, where there are two titanic and opposing ideologies constantly clashing over how to answer these, these consequential questions, uh, that things could get pretty ugly. And... Um, I think you, you, are, you all know what I'm talking about. I'm, of course, I'm talking about the time of the ancient Jewish philosophical schools of Hillel and Shammai 2000 years ago. Uh, I said it could get ugly and yet it didn't. So if you're not familiar with Hillel and Shammai, there were these epic debates recorded in the Talmud and the Mishnah and um, please don't ask me questions about the Talmud and the Mishnah because I probably don't know any more than you do. Um, but um, I will tell you that there was one rabbinic school of thought led by its philosophical founder, Hillel, and there was another led by its philosophical founder, Shammai. And they seem to disagree on almost everything. How to celebrate the holidays, including details as small as from which direction one should light the Hanukkah candles to how to speak with people, to whom one could marry, which is to say, who is a Jew? What foods can be eaten and therefore in whose house you could eat? The results of these debates would be and, and were entirely consequential for Jewish life. And yet the people uh, in these two opposing houses had great respect for each other. And because of that, the disagreements they had didn't descend into contempt, but instead those disagreements sharpened each other's thinking, which ultimately led to the uncovering of better solutions for the problems they were both working on. So how did this happen? They, they maintained close relationships. They ate in each other's homes. Their, their children married each other. Uh, they, they attacked the issues, not each other. 
which is to say they didn't engage in ad hominem attacks. They didn't attack their opponent personally. Uh, both sides listened to each other. Uh, the Mishnah records both sides at one time or another uh, uh, admitting that they were wrong. <clears throat> they recognized that despite holding opposite opinions, sometimes, sometimes they might both be right. And they had a higher purpose. They were not debating to win. They were debating to learn and to solve problems. And uh, this is what the writers of the Mishnah called disagreement for the sake of heaven. Machlochet l'shem shemaim. Machlochet l'shem shemaim. Disagreement for the sake of heaven. Disagreement for a higher truth. Disagreement for the sake of the greater good. Our country, the United States of America, and more specifically, we, the people of the United States of America, you and I, if we want to solve our problem, we need to start disagreeing for the sake of heaven. We need to start deliberating for the greater good. I, I founded Unify America a little more than a year ago to help American citizens and American society move in this direction. And to be more specific, our mission is to replace politics with problem solving. And if that sounds implausible, please understand there have been Americans working on this mission for 50 years, which by the way, I didn't know when I started Unify America. And then I started reading and talking to people and was delighted to learn that this is, that I'm joining a journey that others have been on. So it's been 50 years and it may be another 50 or 75 more before our labors come to full fruition, before, if you can imagine this, a time where our, our, our grandchildren, great-grandchildren can look at back at this time now and shake their heads wondering, what were they thinking? That's how they tried to solve their communal problems through massive power struggles? How juvenile, how, how self-destructive. No wonder they couldn't solve the problems that they all wanted to solve. So I recognize it's gonna be a long journey, but I believe that we can make huge progress in years, not decades. And Unify America sees three, three big steps in this process. First, we need to get rid of the contempt that we have for each other. Second, we need to develop the capacity to deliberate for the sake of the greater good. We Americans need training. Uh, third, we currently attempt to solve our communal problems through an adversarial process, one side fighting another at the national, state, city, municipal level. We try to solve our collective problems through fighting, which is a crazy way to solve problems. We need to define a communal decision-making process that allows us to solve our problems collaboratively, that brings us together instead of ripping us apart. So this morning, I'm going to give you a taste of the first and describe the second and third for you, and then I'd be delighted to take your questions. So let's, let's begin with step one, reducing contempt. Uh, let me see a show of hands, um, and I'm going to switch my view so I can see you all here. Um, how many of you have had a relationship become strained or otherwise negatively impacted because of politics or know of someone who has? Please raise your hands. Okay, Mo most of you, or at least most of you who've got your cameras on. I could, I could just, I'm just gonna average it out for the people who don't have their cameras on. I'll be like, I'll just assume it's the same. Um, yeah. It's a big problem. Um, and I think uh, everyone here on the phone is, uh, or in this call, or most of us, are, have been around long enough to know that it, it, it's, it hasn't always been like this. Um, it, is, it is one thing to be contemptuous of a political leader whose actions you find problematic or worse. It is, it is another thing to be contemptuous of someone who voted for that leader. How someone votes, which is to say how they answer a single multiple choice question. For most of us, a binary choice question. That is a very blunt instrument for judging someone's character. I grew up in Glenview, which was politically mixed at a time when politics wasn't quite the, the blood sport it is today. 
but then went to college at Brown University, which is politically, it's basically the Berkeley of the East. Uh, I moved back to Chicago, blue Chicago, and now live in Evanston, which is an even bluer part of the Chicago metropolitan area. So while I have always rejected, really always rejected the labels liberal and conservative, I have spent a long time swimming in a sea of progressive liberalism. So before I began Unify America, I traveled through the American South and I, I interviewed conservatives, lifelong Republicans, evangelical Christians, Southern Baptists, and Trump voters, many of whom were some combination of those things. And no one, I'm telling you, no one I met fit the stereotype once I got them to open up. Individuals are far more nuanced than any stereotype allows once you get to know them. I'm gonna tell you a couple of stories. Um, so probably the most kind of extreme character I met uh, was, I'm gonna use the name Patrick, that's not his real name. Uh, in North Carolina, Patrick is a trucker. He and his wife lived in a little house um, uh, outside Charlotte. And, um, you know, we sat down at their kitchen table and he started spinning out some really amazing conspiracy theories <laughs> to me. Um, and um, at one point, he said, all right, now, Harry, listen, this, this one, this one's going to sound, I know this one's going to sound crazy, but, uh, but just, but just hear me out here. And basically explained how, um, that, uh, Obama and Clinton, um, wanted for, um, American hostages, uh, to be taken, uh, by Islamic terrorists so that, uh, we could then swap the ISIS leaders that we have in Guantanamo for the American hostages so that our president and secretary of state could give the ISIS their leaders back. And I said, you know, Patrick, I totally agree with you. That sounds crazy. <laughs> and, and he laughed. Um, but then, you know, I took him through the survey that you're going to get a little taste of today. And it turns out he wants all the same things for the United States that we all want. And, um, and further there's this, you know, there's a stereotype about conservatives not being compassionate. He and his wife had adopted three poor children from the Philippines and raised them and they were now adults. Um, and when his church was running a campaign to stop human trafficking, sex trafficking, he and his wife brought two women into their home to shelter them who were both addicted to drugs. Candidly, I don't know anybody who would do that personally. It was the first person I'd met. So, I mean, this idea of like conservatives lacking compassion is like really, miss, it really misses the mark. And that was, that was just one story of many. It's like when you get to know people, you just, there's just so much more that unfolds about how, how who they are. Um, what I also found is that people I met had uh, sort of from the sort of conservative South, had really wrong-headed stereotype views of people, you know, on the other side. So let me tell you another story about a woman I met named Kathleen. Um, and she was in um, Kentucky. And so in the survey that you're going to take, uh, I don't think this question is in the little taste version that you're going to get today, but there's a question um, about um, um, abortion. So we started talking about abortion and she said, Harry, I just, I just, I just don't understand how can all these liberals be okay with all of these thousands and thousands of third trimester abortions. I just don't get it. And then, and then the abortions after the baby is born, how can that be okay? 
And I said, wow, you know, um, Kathleen, I, um, you know, I know, I know a lot of liberals, people who call themselves liberals. And um, I'll tell you, I, um, I, I don't know any who think a third trimester abortion is okay, except in really extreme circumstances when the life of the mother is in jeopardy. Um, and I think an abortion after a baby's born is murder. So yeah, I, I, I don't think it's like that at all. I'm not sure where, you know, what you read, but, and I, it's not like I've got a, I, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know the stats on third trimester abortion. So I'm not gonna pretend that I, I know more than I do, but I don't, I don't personally know people who think that that's okay. And she just looked at me and she's like, oh my God, I am so relieved. I, I'm like, I'm so relieved for you to be telling me that. So two things there is, you know, there's just, there's a huge amount of misunderstanding because, because of the stereotypes that we experience on social media or in the media. Like who knows what Kathleen read to get that information? But here's what I speculate. I speculate it was not, there are thousands and thousands of third trimester abortions and everybody's okay with that. I speculate it might've been a single story, a true story about a third trimester abortion somewhere. And then Kathleen did what we all tend to do, which is extrapolate. We read one frightening story and then start to believe it's happening everywhere. You know, you, you read the crazy rants of a dozen people on Facebook and you think, oh God, they're all like that. All, all 70 plus million of them. <laughs> On our side, well, yes, we're all very different. There's, there's a lot of different perspectives on our side, but those other people, those people, they're all the same. I think we all do that a little bit. And I mean, it's nuts, but we do it. So what I was doing when I was going through the South, as I kind of alluded to, was I was giving people this survey and it was a survey about what are our aspirations as Americans? And the survey questions generally, they're, they're, they're written, um, it's different from a normal survey because they're not written as, um, as asking people what they think about tactics. Like it's not asking, you know, what do you think of school vouchers? Or uh, what do you think of um, uh, 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 a border wall? Or what do you think of Medicare for all? It's not, it's not asking those kinds of questions. Those are tactics. It's asking about goals? What, what are the end results that we want to achieve? And what I was trying to do is to see, like, are there actually a, a universe of goals, of aspirations for this country that 90, 95% of us can all agree on? Because if we can, then we can stop demonizing each other because we want the same end result. Now we just need to find a different way to get together and to, uh, figure out how we find a solution together. And that's what I'm getting to. So now- um, If I can just, um, Harry, yeah. um, Blair you know, brought me your name and said, Unify America. And I went on and you, have, you can go on and sign up to talk to someone who doesn't have your political viewpoints. And this is before the election. And I signed right up. And as it got closer to the date, and I'd, been a, I'd done a lot of phone calling in Wisconsin and- it gotten a lot of angry um, Green Bay men. I was dreading it. And your organization calls, you know, it's a day away, it's five hours a day, don't forget to do this. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll do it. And the questions you ask are amazing and magnificent and have been wordsmith so that they bring out, well, I thought the best of both of us. Um, I had a young woman from the Naval Academy. I knew where things were going. I don't know that she did, but it was, um, I'll, ju I'll just never forget that experience. And, uh, um, you know, and, and, and look forward to everybody experience a little bit of that today. Yes, thank you so much, Vanessa. I, I, I think I really appreciate the testimonial and I'm so glad it was a good experience for you. I am putting into the chat a link to this survey. And this, there's only five questions in this one, but there's some stuff you need to read together. 
the point is you'll you'll each have your own survey. You'll answer the questions individually, but you'll discuss the questions as you go. We'll give you 15 minutes. But right now, if you'd all please click on that link, that little tiny URL link on there, and just just make sure that you can um, open uh, the link. You should be able to open it. And then um, we're going to, um, uh, Vanessa's gonna put everybody into a room with one other window, not necessarily another person if there's two of you in a window, but with one other window and you'll be in a breakout room and then just go through the survey together, try to set it up so that, you know, kind of drag a window so you can see the, the person you're talking to on one side and you can see the survey in the other if you can. If you have some struggles with it, you know, do the best you can. If you don't get through it, that's okay. Um, so hopefully everybody getting the, the link open in their browser. I'm gonna um, change mine to a gallery view. Um, so just to reiterate, I'm putting you in a breakout room. You just say join, I'll bring you back in. So you don't have to worry about any of that. Um, and then you will go through the survey. And for the Gary, folks who've got their, their camera off, it'd be I'm sure it'll be nice for whoever you're with to see each other. So please consider turning your camera on if you if you can. So let's for the people who can't get into the link, stay on for everybody else. Vanessa, did you already set up send out the breakout? I, yeah, so I'm doing 21 um, because I figured you and I will stay back. And yep. um, uh, are we ready to go then? Yeah, so it's 1055. Um, when will when will I bring them back, Harry? Um, at 11, uh, 10. Great. Okay, here we go. So just click on the join. There you go. All right, so I have these people. Um, maybe like um, Celian, I'm going to move her to another. Um, I was thrown into the 17, but it said I said okay. not now. So, so maybe an empty room. Oh, oh wait, um, wait. Oh wait, Marvin's asked for help. Okay. I seem to be in the breakout room by myself. Huh. Vanessa, are you there? She went to go help somebody. Stand by. I had to log back in as soon as I clicked on the as soon as I clicked on the um, the the questions. I I maintained the audio, but I lost the video for the Zoom. Huh. Okay. I wonder if uh, it just one window popped in front of another window. It, that's not how it works on my computer, I think. Well, even if you can't see the person, if you can hear them, I guess. Right, but I, I, I was saying hello and I was, uh, I seem to be there by myself. Okay, let me try again. So Joyce, did you come back because there was nobody in your room? You've got, you're, you're muted. Okay. Um, let me see if I can. I can I'm. I, I I'm gonna, seem to be by myself in breakout room eight. Okay. Um, Lee, is that you? Yes. Okay. Why don't I try to put you? Let's see if I can do this. Um, let's see who else is. So, Joyce. Up. Uh, I'm Try to go to breakout room eight, Joyce. I don't know how to get to it. Says did, 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 it, did, it, did it just offer you an option to go there? It should be something on screen that says. And then let's see. Um, so Marilyn. 
Marilyn, can you, it looks like there's somebody who's waiting for you, Marilyn. Can you join them? Or maybe you're not. All right, let's try this. Um, Alvin, do you wanna, can I put you in a room with someone? Alvin, can I put you in a room with someone? He's muted. No, I uh, can't get onto the link, so I'll just kind of wait for the results. Well, that's okay, because somebody can actually read the read it to you. So let me try to put you in 19. Um, Arthur, how about uh, we'll put Ar uh, you in the same room with Arthur. is muted. Okay. Vanessa, you're muted. So Alvin, if you can sit, can you click yes to, to join in the room? Oh, there's Joyce and Lee. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 it looked like I went in twice and it was, I was by myself in room eight. Okay. Let me go. I, I have to join another room. I was by myself too. In the room. Well, it's really, um, God. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate uh, myself, but I can't argue with myself. So you are both, because I both put you in room eight, Lee and Joyce. Let's try, do you have an option to join, Lee? Yes. And Joyce, do you have an option to join? Not that I see on my screen. It's not, it's not a, it's not a pop-up, Joyce. It's along the, it's the bar along the bottom. Leave, leave. Say share screen. Is that the one you want? Nope, nope, nope. Uh, take it off of, take it off of uh, full screen view. And then there's a bar across the bottom where you see participants, chat, share. And right next to that, there's another icon that's new, new to me at least, that says join breakout room. Breakout rooms, it says. I have breakout rooms at the bottom. It doesn't say join, it just says breakout rooms. Oh, okay. Huh. Click that, you have been assigned to breakout room number eight, join breakout room. And that's yeah, click that. And then Lee, you go too. And then hopefully this will work. Okay, and then how do I see the, I've, I've got a different window for the, I've got a different window for the for the questions. So I right. would have to leave the Zoom to see the questions. Well, the Zoom is will be in one window and the questions will be in a second window. So you can just go back and forth between them or you can set it up so you can see both at the same time. Yeah, I don't know, how, I, I have a Chromebook and I'm not sure, I'll try. Yeah, give it a try. Okay. Sorry to share, but I'm still alone in that room. No, we'll go. That's okay. She she was still here. Just go right back to her, and just and wait wait in there if you keep if, so that she yeah go go right back. She's there for you now. Okay. Okay. What's my unassigned? Who? Oh, assigned to. I'll put her in room um, two. There we go. Where is Bill Rosen? Um, Harry, do you want to take, um, um, oh, Bill is here. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll fly on the wall. We're right. Just um, do you want to take them, um, Al and, and Bill, through it uh, just a little bit? We don't have that much time. Um, you mean just here? Sure. Yeah, yeah. That sounds like a good way to do it, actually. Um, okay, I'm going to, um, let me bring this up, bring the, So, okay. Okay, for those of you who are not in rooms, <laughs> um, here's the first question in the survey that you, you, would, you would be answering with your partner. Yeah. We should make sure that all Americans have access to high quality, affordable healthcare. Now you wanna put aside how the goal would be pursued, who would mm -hmm. pursue it in exceptions to the rule. This is not about how this happens. Right. You know, don't think Medicare for all or, you know, uh, you know, managed care or forget about all that. The question is, is this the end result we wanna achieve? 
Um, so Alvin, what would you say? Uh, uh, you, unmute yourself, Alvin, please. And Joyce, why don't you unmute yourself too? And Marilyn, if you're if you're here with us, unmute yourself. Go ahead, Alvin. I, I strongly agree. Joyce? I don't know what I should be agreeing with or not. I'm sorry. I never got to meet with anyone but myself in the room. Well, for this question, you see this question on screen here? No, I don't see a question. On, I'm sorry, I can't read it. It says, what is it? Um, it says, we should make sure that all Americans have access to high quality, affordable health care. Strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. I have absolutely no opinion. I would agree. We could hope that we could work toward that goal, but we can't guarantee it. Right. Uh, William? Yeah, I strongly agree. How do you mark the thing, though? I, I'm pushing box A and nothing happens. <laughs> well, on, on, you're looking at my screen right now. If oh, the people in the breakout okay. room have their own version of the survey. Okay, okay. So yeah, I'm going to yeah. just say, I'll, I will, in, in everyone's yeah. behalf, I know Alvin strongly agreed. Marilyn, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you now. Oh, good. What's your, what's your, because we can't see you, so I wasn't sure. What's your, what, what's your answer to this? I, I agree. Great. Okay. So let's do that. If an individual decides not to take an FDA approved vaccine for the purpose of stopping a pandemic. That person's mm -hmm. rights to interact in public should be limited and be subject to requirements like wearing a mask. Now, again, putting aside how this goal would be pursued, who would pursue it and exceptions to the rule. In general, do you strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree or have no opinion? Mm -hmm. Marilyn, why don't we start with you? <clears throat> well, I, I don't know that you'd be able to get them to wear a mask, but it would be a good idea to, uh, if they're not going to do one thing, that they should do something, at, at least do something. Okay. So I agree. Alvin? I don't have an opinion on this one. Okay. Joyce? I strongly agree. I think it's necessary for the welfare of others. This is Lee. I agree as well. Okay. Oh, Lee's in here too. Sorry, I'm not yep. seeing everybody. Okay, there we go, great. Um, oh, and there's more people here. Well, oh, there's a whole bunch of people here. Yeah, I closed the rooms because oh, you did? Oh. it's 11.06. Oh, oh, okay. So. So everybody's coming back. Everybody's okay. coming back, yes. All right, for those of you who didn't see it, um, let's go, I'll quickly go through the other mm -hmm. ones here. Well, there's a video here. Um, I don't know if we're gonna have enough time to watch the video. Well, but I'll go, I'll go ahead and show it. So this is, this is on the question of working with other countries, we should reduce greenhouse gases in the atmosphere while preparing for the impact of climate change on human society. And this is a few people talking about that. I definitely agree. I mean, I think it's an existential threat that we have right now to our country and to the world. And if we don't take it on a, in a global way, then our efforts are just going to be a tiny bit. I mean, more than a tiny bit because we make up a, a large portion of it, but they, it can't be enough alone for just us to go at it. It's got to be a global effort. I, I agree with that. Um, I think we should work on greenhouse gases and pollution safe in the back. where it's not hurting economies and citizens. Uh, I love walking outside every day in the country and breathing fresh, clean air. Other countries don't have the regulations that we have. Uh, we may be doing more than our part in the United States and not forcing another country to do their part. Super, super agree. You know, the planet was a gift and um, not to get um, real Christian on you at this point, but um, I have to say it was a gift from God and we need to take care of it. Um, we need to take care of this planet or it's not gonna take care of us. Um, and then we got this question, the same question. We'll just say, I agree for this one to move on. Then we had another one, but I think most of you got to, did most of you get to this? Just not if you got to these, because we can then kind of, well, I can move on with the rest of the presentation. 
Um, yeah, just to let everyone know, now you're back in the big, pre you're, we're all together. There we go. Everyone can see one another. Um, and Harry was just um, showing some people. It, I, I realized the technology was challenging, but you know what, Nat, when we have you back, Harry, we'll, we'll know how to do this. All right. Sounds great. Um, okay. So let's go on to step two, which is training well i guess i should wrap that up with um you know let's let me take a minute actually would you um if there's some insight that you got from the experience in the breakout rooms of going through this survey um or anything that you learned or anything that you noticed that you find valuable do you mind let's take a minute and type it into chat because i'd love to see what your reactions were Um, and as they're typing into the chat, if they want to see any of these videos or anything, it's all on that URL for the, um, in the survey we were taking. Is that correct, Harry? Yes. Good answer. people are, are thinking or maybe typing, but um, Harry, I can tell you, and I shared with you before we started that, um, you know, when, when I did this with this young woman, first of all, at the end, um, and it took about an hour um, and we, um, you know, people had to, you know, when you signed up, you knew that, you know, you have to kind of put your best foot forward and, you know, at the end, I felt so good. And we have some, now we have something, now we're coming in here. We didn't have enough time, but. All right, we're getting a couple of answers in. Mm -hmm. We were delighted with how common and similar our thoughts were. So this is the interesting thing. Um, you, it, it's very likely, like if you were to sign up and do the Unified Challenge and we pair you with somebody who's really different from you, maybe politically different, maybe racially different, maybe religiously different, maybe the level of religiosity is different, very religious versus not very religious, um, rural, urban, age, et cetera. Um, most people find that they share the same goals for the country regardless and like each other. We've had people on who are like fervent Trump supporters and fervent Bernie Sanders supporters. And I mean, this one, this one pair, they were on for two and a half hours. I mean, they'd, they'd finished the survey an hour earlier. <laughs> they were still talking because they really liked each other. And I think they were surprised at how much they liked each other and how much they had in common. They didn't agree on every answer, but they agreed on almost all the answers. I think it was like 46 out of the 50. At that, at that time, we had more questions. So we needed more time. Yes. Yeah, so if you sign up for the Real Unified Challenge, you'll get more time. Um, okay. I'm gonna. Um, Harry, one one um, comment, which um, you know, I I resonate with. We do a lot of uh, Tikkun alum social action at Macomb Solar Lakeside, but how do we talk to other people, not just you know, the people on the Tikkun alum committee or at Macomb Solar Lakeside? And, and that was, you know, would love to have discussion with someone other than a temple member. This is a way to do it. You know, if you go to unifyamerica.org and sign up. I'm gonna uh, put that URL in there as well. So let me, let, let me keep going so that we kind of uh, finish on time here, and at least in the vicinity of finishing on time. Um, I'm gonna take you through what we are, doing for training. Uh, and this is, this is, this is uh, admittedly, this is all future oriented. We have, we're, we're, on, we're, we're only a year old. So we have a lot of programming to create, but to tell you kind of what our plans are for how to, how to, um, how to train Americans to be the best version of ourselves with each other, which is I think a prerequisite for us to be able to start to work together to solve our problems together. 
So just some examples of sort of the curriculum that we would follow. Uh, first, training people to listen. No, really listen. So we all have the experience of being good listeners sometimes. How many, how many, of, you, how many of you think I'm a very good listener? Raise your hand. How many of you feel like you're a very good listener? Okay. How many of you feel like you're a very good listener all the time? Anybody? <laughs> right. So like sometimes we're listening and sometimes we're just looking for an opportunity to talk. And it's not just the listening. It's, it, it's, it's learning how to, um, to listen in such a way that you find the meaning, the underlying meaning of what somebody is actually trying to say. And sometimes someone who's talking doesn't exactly even know what is the part of what they're saying that really matters. And listening is helping that person unfold and, and get to the heart and soul of what it is that they're talking about, which when you're trying to make a decision is actually gonna be quite valuable. But it'll also help you with your relationships with people. <laughs> it is literally, I've done some training already with a group called Resetting the Table. And when I follow the advice, I have a much easier time talking to my teenage children, I have to say. Um, a course on establishing facts. A fact is a statement that is supported by adequate evidence. And so what makes evidence adequate? What makes certain evidence inadequate? Uh, there are high confidence facts because they have a lot of this evidence. There are other facts that have less of less evidence, but are kind of across a threshold for being a fact. And then there are statements that just, even if they're, they may be true, there just simply isn't enough evidence to prove that they are true. And so they can't be considered a fact. So it's also, I mean, I think we all know that we've got some, we have some fact problems. So we're like, well, what actually is a fact? And we don't seem to be talking about that. Um, a, imagine a class on building a healthy society and examining this question of our rights, our liberty, and our collective responsibilities to the whole. And there's all kinds of sort of interesting case studies that are not so obvious. I mean, there's the obvious one, like the, uh, the guy who uh, was unhappy, uh, who bought a ticket on a cruise ship, was unhappy because uh, his cabin didn't have a room because he was by this, uh, at the level of the sea. And so he broke through the wall to create a window for himself. And of course the water starts filling in and everyone's like, schmuck, what are you doing? And he's like, shouldn't I have a window like everybody else? <laughs> so there's the obvious things, but there's also like some not so obvious things where it's a little bit harder to know where the line is between our, our individual rights and our responsibilities. Um, catching the numbers when they lie. Most of us, we don't, think deeply enough when we see data. And if we're in a position where we need to make decisions, we actually really need to understand how data works. By way of example, if you hear, oh, the cancer rate is, is, is gone up by 100% for this one type of cancer, that sounds very frightening. But then you really, you must ask the question, is this the type of cancer where there are 400,000 cases a year or where there are four cases a year because the difference between going from 400,000 to 800,000 or four to eight cases is really, really different. And furthermore, um, people need to understand what is the difference between things like causality and correlation, that this happened because of this versus this happened um, Ha just happened to go along with this, but it's not, but it's not because it caused it. It's just, it, it's a, it's a side effect. Uh, it's not a side effect. It's, it just happens to go together. So we need to teach people about that. Curating your information diet. Uh, there's a, there's a term uh, that the kids use called doom scrolling. You go onto a news site and you just read one story after another about how terrible the world is. And of course you're looking through a very, very small lens. There's so many wonderful things happening in the world, but if you only read like the news and certain social media feeds, you will have this idea that the world is entirely a, a, a dangerous place to be feared and, there's, and there are awful people everywhere. And so not that we, we, need, to be, we need to know, um, you know some of the bad things that are happening, but if we, 
if we inundate ourselves with it, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a little bit like, it's like chemotherapy. If you take the right amount, it, it can make you healthy again. You can, you, you can, you can use it to sort of so solve the problem. If you take too much, it's gonna kill you. Uh, defense against the dark arts. Some of you, if any of you are Harry Potter fans, you might know this reference, but you know, fear mongering is something that really, I mean, it, it drives so many of our problems that are going on right now. Um, and so do conspiracy theories. And so we wanna kind of unpack how people are manipulated uh, by people through fear mongering and how people are manipulated through conspiracy theories. Uh, and then seeing the whole truth. In our society right now through politics, we tend to say something's all good if it's on our side and it's all bad if it's on the other side. So I was bringing up, you know, for example, school vouchers. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're like want, you know, public schools to be solid and serve all children, you're against school vouchers, school vouchers are all bad. And if you're for school vouchers because you think that it's a way to create some competition and it'll like it'll it'll force uh, uh, schools that aren't performing to start performing, then it's all good. And of course, it's neither of those things because once you actually start looking into the details, the whole truth is is always more complicated than that. And and we if we're going to make decisions, we need to identify what are the pieces of an idea that are good and what are the pieces of an idea that are problematic so that we can continue to shape the idea to, to maximize the parts of, of, a, of an idea that are going to work well for us and, and limit the parts of an idea that are not going to work well for us. Uh, and this is the last one that I have for you today. It's called bias breaker. We have all these weird biases um, and these biases uh, really cloud the way that we make decisions. So we've got three here, availability bias. Availability bias is if in the last week you've heard about three crimes in your area, you are going to think crime is everywhere because that is what is available to you in your, in your memory. There's lots and lots of crime. It may have absolute, it could simply be happenstance. There may have nothing to do, the crime rate could be down, but you just happen to hear of Three, three crimes, but we have this bias that we make this assumption. So that's that's an example. The recency bias is one of something that's, well, that's actually, I, I gave you an example of something that's both availability and recency bias. And the confirmation bias is, is our tendency to believe uh, and only see evidence for things that we already believe and ignore evidence for things that we don't believe that we wanna keep confirming what we already believe. And we, and we all do this and it's something that we need to be able to overcome if we're going to make good decisions. So that's some examples of the sort of training um, that we um, plan to, to, to create and a curriculum so that people do the Unify Challenge. Hopefully that opens them up and says, oh, you know what? The other side isn't so bad after all. They're very good people. They, they want many of the same things that I want. I don't understand how, why they voted they did, but maybe we can work together. And then for people to come together who are not all from the same temple, um, but from different parts of the country who are you know, different demographically, different politically, to train together um, and to gain some of these skills. And then so finally, going on to the third step, um, which is a new and collaborative process for collective decision-making. How can we institutionalize disagreeing for the sake of heaven? How do we deliberate for the greater good? Um, and I'm gonna share my screen again uh, and take you through that. So I'm gonna kind of, walk, this is kind of the, our, our, our vision deck, which I'll take you through quickly here. So as I mentioned, Unify America's mission is to replace politics with problem solving. Uh, hang on just one moment here. So uh, if you are skeptical, uh, that would be reasonable. We're talking about the work of a generation, but we have an actual hypothesis about how to begin to make this monumental shift. And it begins with someone, in fact, someone just like you, signing up to talk one-on-one -on -one 
with another American who is not like you and discover for yourself that we all share the same goals for the country. That's the first step in our first quest, namely to bring together 10,000 Americans from all walks of life to find and implement a shared and ambitious solution by consensus to an intractable national problem by July 4th, 2026. That's the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, it's, it's insanely ambitious. I recognize that. But suspend your disbelief for a second and let's look at where politics has gotten us in the last 75 years. In the 1950s, we began building America's interstate highway system. In the 1960s, we passed historic civil rights legislation. In the 1970s, we created the Environmental Protection Agency. And after that, when it came to solving our biggest domestic problems, in practically every area, education, energy, healthcare, criminal justice, infrastructure, the environment, poverty, and on and on, it's been a whole lot of fighting without a whole lot of progress. So why are we stuck? Because after all, our founders dreamed of a country free of angry partisanship. Alexander Hamilton, who founded the US financial system and was the first secretary of the treasury said, factions would ruin us. Political parties are the most fatal disease. And James Madison, father of the constitution and the fourth president of the United States said, in every political society, parties are unavoidable. The great object should be to combat the evil. But then they both founded political parties to combat each other. Um, and they created a system to institutionalize angry partisanship. And ever since America has been stuck solving its biggest problems through a political process, having two teams fight each other, wielding whatever money, power, and influence they can on representatives who want to be reelected. I mean, yes, we hope our lawmakers eventually make smart compromises and our hopes are regularly dashed, but the reality is politics is a poor way to solve big problems. Uh, but there is another approach to problem solving and it's called problem solving. More specifically, the pioneers in, in our field that, that Unify America is in call it deliberative democracy. And I want you to remember that word because it is gonna be a household term in the next five years, deliberative democracy. So what does deliberative democracy look like? So imagine bringing together a large and diverse group of regular Americans with no conflict of interest ac ac across the country. So they're not all sitting in front of, a, of one screen from across the country. And then you establish a shared goal. Let's say high quality, affordable healthcare for everyone. And everyone agrees on that. So we have a shared goal. Then we review a set of possible solutions. Let's look at four different possible solutions, not this or nothing. Medicare for all or not Medicare for all, you know, uh, background checks on guns or not background checks on guns. <laughs> you know, that's not the way to do it. Four possible different solutions. And then looking at the pros and cons on each. Um, and then through multiple rounds of deliberation among Americans and a series of votes, we narrow it down to one set of solutions by consensus, like a citizen's jury, like a big citizen's jury, an all America jury, a jury of American citizens. Um, this country was, was established on the premise that we the people can solve our biggest problems, even our biggest problems but we need a better process to do it. We need a process that is based on problem solving through reason and empathy, not through money and power and influence. The partisanship that our founders feared and then and unfortunately fostered must be overcome. And we are the generation that will make it happen. We are the generation that will learn how to attack our shared problems and not each other. 
We are the generation that will learn to listen to each other and admit when we are wrong. We are the generation that will recognize that two different opinions can sometimes both be right. We are the generation that will recognize that we are already unified in our aspirations for America. And we are the generation that will recognize the power of different opinions to allow us to find shared solutions together. And that is how we will unify America. Thank you. Drop the mic. Um, I have one question, but before we begin, um, you started off with Hillel and Shammai, who um, two houses who had very different opinions. And the one thing that has always resonated with me is that the minority opinion was written down. Like we know what they both thought about whatever they were discussing. Um, and the question I have for you is um, from Lee, how does this collaborative approach work with emotionally charged issues? Although I would say that some of those issues you already mentioned are emotionally charged, but she um, said like immigration, Israel, or LGBTQ rights. So our approach is to first start off with what is our common goal. Um, I mean, if you wanna take something as contentious as Israel, I think that if we could all snap our fingers um, and have the Israelis and Palestinians living in peace with one another, and having shared commerce, we do it in a second. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know an, an, anybody who would want something other than that. So, you, so, you, so is of course it's, th that's maybe the most extreme circumstance. Um, and in our case, we're focused on the United States. But when you begin with a shared goal and say, we're going to have different opinions, but we want the same end result. So let's let's not demonize each other. That, I think, is the beginning point. But the rest of it is all this training. It's the training to realize that when you open your mind and you don't make people defensive, that you don't necessarily get into loggerheads. And if you do, of course, you need a good facilitator to kind of pull you back from the edge. And remember, you guys want the same thing. We need to use our different opinions to find better solutions. You, you, you don't want to look for a solution where everybody's got the same idea around the table, right? So our approach is like change the game. If you're in the political game, which is I want this and you want that. Somebody walks in like, here's my plan. So if somebody walks in with a plan, a bill, I mean, this is the way our system works. Somebody walks in and says, here's my bill. Now sign on to my bill, endorse my bill. Well, if you're trying to get people on board, why would you already walk in with a completely fully baked plan and be like, okay, now let's fight it out and hopefully we'll compromise at the end. Why not start with a goal and say, let's work together to find a solution and not let's not like make it binary. Let's look at multiple different ways to do it. So it's really like just trying to change the whole paradigm of decision-making. And there have been citizen juries that have been going on now for 50 years and are happening in pockets all over the world. And it's extraordinary what regular citizens can do when they get good information, they have access to experts and time and a context in which they are encouraged to deliberate and come to a consensus. And I'll say one other thing about coming to a consensus. How many of you have been on a jury? A few of you? If you, if you, if you haven't and you get a chance, you should, you should, I can't recommend it enough. Conversation with people where, you, where the only way you win is to come together is really different than when you don't need to do that. Then you're like, everyone's trying to win. But in a jury room, you only have a success if everybody actually comes together. And so people listen to each other differently. We wanna take that idea and bring it into our national decision-making and to our communal decision-making. So I hope that answers the question. Um, I, I see Phyllis, but um, I have another question. Um, what is the future from Sandy Simon? What is the future of our political parties then Phyllis? I don't know. I mean, I, I just said like, that is, that's not a question that I, I, I can answer. I think um, there is, there's obviously like everything else, there's positives and negatives. There are positive things that political parties have done over the years. And there's of course a lot of negative stuff. 
that's happening as well. Um, but we're, we're, I, I don't know, I don't know what the, the role is. What I hope is, is that members of both political parties are, are frustrated by the situation that they find themselves in. I don't think all politicians are bad. I, my understanding is from people who've actually spent quite a bit of time with politicians, we're, we're, we're in partnership with organizations that work with a lot of politicians. And they say like, you know, look, most of, most of, these, most of these folks are patriots. They wanna, they wanna go to Washington and do the right thing. But imagine saying, listen, here's how this is gonna work, you know, new lawmaker. Uh, you're gonna go in there and you're gonna be getting pressured by your political party. You're gonna be getting pressured by your most extreme constituents who are ready to like tear you down. You've got a, a new opponent coming your way in two years or six years, depending on whether you're in the Senate or the Congress. You've got the media hammering on you over here and you better start raising money. Oh, and also um, we would like you to act with integrity and work with the other side and become very well informed and make good decisions. I mean, it's impossible. It, it's like it's like putting people into a cage match and saying, be thoughtful. So the only way the system's going to change is if we, the people who ultimately are the source of power, if we change it. In order to change it, we need to change ourselves. So again, this is this is a long-term vision. This is generations, but we have to start somewhere. So we, I have um, a question, Wendy, go ahead about how we can respond, you know, even though this is a long-term thing, how do we respond today? Wendy, go ahead, ask your question. Hello, I, um, I don't know how this happened. I received a uh, 2021 congressional district canvas. Um, I do live in the state of Missouri and it's for the Republican party. And what they have said is um, just a couple of snippets. Dear Ms. Schenker, stopping Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and the radical Democrats from forcing their big government socialist agenda on our nation is going to take a massive effort all across America. And there's an entire page more of that kind of thing. It is absolutely vital that we act now to work to ensure fair elections and that we are able to implement the state of the state of the art grassroots voter organizations will need in every district of the county to confront and prevail over Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and the radical socialist Democrats damaging agenda for our country. Um, freedom destroying measures versus executive orders they want to stand against. And then there's an actual survey that, that first it's uh, political profile in terms of um, my, who I am, and then general issues. Do you think the country, the nation is going in the right or wrong direction? Um, do you approve or disapprove of the Democrats agenda to raise taxes, provide free health care and college tuition for all, take away our freedoms, open our borders to all immigrants, enact dangerous abortion policies, and so forth and so on? Yep. I mean, I can continue. Sure. What what, Wendy, did you have a, Wendy, did you have, do you have a question? <laughs> How do I respond? You, uh, do I, I, do I, I, sen I sense your best response is to put it in the garbage. <laughs> I mean, can candidly, I, I mean, there's nothing surprising about that. I mean, actually, I get, I get literature from both sides. Um, and... Um, it's, there, yeah, there, I mean, I don't find anything surprising about that at all, because that is the system we're in. We're in a system that is about, the, I mean, fear mongering, which is what that is, works in order to motivate people to give money and to amass power, because we're in a system that is making decisions based on power. So if you're in a system that requires power, then you end up doing things like that. So the reason that I brought it up is that that was my first instinct and I've gotten these before. And, but then I thought, is there a way to, you know, build a bridge? Is there a way to, you know, have a conversation? Um, and maybe this is, this is not the way to do it, but like, I, I was thinking along your, your thought and saying, you know, is there any way to reach out, but, you know, maybe not in this, not through that, not through that. That is probably writing, writing back to them with a nice note is probably not the way to, to make the connection because those are a bunch of professional people who are trying to raise money. I mean, that's just, that's like fundraising. And um, 
So no, that's not, that's probably not the avenue. And also I'll tell you another avenue. It's probably not getting on Facebook and debating people. Um, the, it, social media is, it is very difficult for uh, flowers to bloom uh, when they are, when the seeds are planted in toxic soil. And there, there are good things about social media for sure. Um, bridging political divides is not one of its virtues. Um, I have another question. Can you comment on the Problem Solvers Caucus in the U.S. Congress? That's from Alice. Yeah, I, I, um, I um, know that the Problem Solvers Caucus um, is uh, associated with another organization in our space, No Labels. I actually don't know that much about them. So I, I, don't, have a, I don't have a comment about it, but I'm, I'm thrilled that there is a Problem Solvers Caucus. Uh, eventually, um, we will almost certainly um, get to know them very well because the solution that we hope to bring together with Americans, like we can't leave legislators out of that process because then we'll be operating in a vacuum. Like if you create a solution with 10,000 Americans, it's very high profile event. You need legislators who are already bought in the process. So there's a possibility of bringing it to Congress and getting the legislative aspects of it passed. So we will, we are in, we are, we are in a kind of budding partnership with a group called the Millennial Action Project, which works with, I think it's something like 1400 legislators across the country, some in Congress, um, most at the state level, almost split 50-50 between Republicans and Democrats, all millennials. And their whole thing is like, we can't do it the way our parents did it. <laughs> like this, is, this isn't working. And so they're trying to like bridge the divide among legislators and we're, we're starting to work with them. Well, it's been a great morning. I really encourage all of you to go to Unify America. Um, you know, my experience, you know, I will always remember it. And, you know, if you're looking for more, um, you know, uh, Tikkun Olam, um, Diane, what do we have coming up tomorrow? Okay, tomorrow night is the first of our Tikkun Olam three-part series. We have an outstanding speaker, the executive director of TRUA, Rabbi Jill Jacobs, and she will address building a just society, defining the world we want and working toward making it happen. And we'll be following up to, with two sessions after that to explain how this is gonna all work. So tune in tomorrow night, seven o'clock. The links are in the McComb at home. Be and there. I, right. <laughs> You, you need to um, register, and I just put it in the, uh, oh, thank it you. In the chat. Yeah, um, it's going to be a great program. Yeah. Harry, we just can't thank you enough, um, and hopefully we can go forth and have um, conversations, whether it's in our family or around the dinner table. You know, Seder's coming up, so you want to make sure that, you know, you can talk to everyone on your Seder, well, probably your Seder Zoom. Um, Diane, go ahead. I have a very quick question for Harry. Harry, this is off of it completely, but how did you go from Jackbox to Unify America? <laughs> yeah, short, short answer is Unify America was actually first. I, I, I piloted this when I was 28 um, in the mid 90s, and it was too early because we really needed the World Wide Web. And the, at that time, the World Wide Web was about nine months old, and I think I was a little... <laughs> I, I thought the technology was going to move a little more quickly than it actually did. Um, so I worked on it for about six months and then put it on the shelf, started a couple of, of companies, but I never forgot about it. So that's, it's just always been in my mind. I wanted to also say for those of you who kind of raised their hand that, you know, know people who've had strained relationships, I, I hope that you'll consider reaching out to members of your family and friends um, who are politically different from you. Um, and sending them our way to unifyamerica.org because uh, we're obviously we, 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 we need everybody um, to come in the door. And it, it, it is, there's, there's really almost no one. And um, we've done hundreds and hundreds of these unified challenges, bringing people together. People leave with a sense of hope. And, uh, and it's, it really is thanks to, you put two human beings together and um, 
um, and, and let them talk to one another. And then suddenly you realize like, oh, if we just did this at scale, we'd be okay. <laughs> so I hope you'll consider doing that. Yeah, I heartily recommend it. Um, something I'll never forget. Um, it's great seeing everyone. Harry, thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, if you, um, you know, uh, regular schedule this week, check your Macomb at home. Uh, the movie on Tuesday is The Chosen. It's on Amer It's on Prime. So you should be able to find it there. And if you have any questions about today, Harry surveys, just email me and I can send you those links. Um, goodbye, everybody. It's a great Thank you so much. Tune in tomorrow night. Yeah, tomorrow yeah. Night. Mm -hmm. yeah. definitely tomorrow right. night. Okay. <laughs>